Hey folks, it's Maxi here and welcome to another TW 2020 video. I believe we're at episode 91 of our AW save. As we have another episode of Lightning on the road to Revolution. So be honest, today's main event is a repeat of last week's. I just want to see if we can get it to a 90, giving it a bit more time. Possibly not because of the lack of psychology, but I wanted gamble. So we'll see what takes place. But apart from that, we move a few things along on the way to that show. So without further ado, let's crack on with it. So we're in the Tri-State area and we are at the Peter J. Lacuras Centre. Maybe? Possibly? Could be. Pre-show matches. Mercedes Vernado, the women's champion, defeats Maya Yukiki in 9.43 with a bank statement. This was a 55. Nice showcase match for Maya. I think like once we get her familiar with a US audience, uh, she could be massive. I don't know too much about her personally, but that's because my Josh Shea information is not great, or knowledge anyway. We had the Prophecy, Jacob Fatu and Brian Pillman Jr. defeat the team of Axel Dieter Jr. and Ilya Dragunov when Pillman Jr. pinned Axel Dieter Jr. with a Tornado DDT. A 65 here, so some pretty impressive stuff on the pre-show. Mia Yim made her debut, she's turned, I just went with a baby face, we gave her a lone wolf gimmick which was great and on the pre-show she defeats Nyla Rose by pinfall, a nice 55 for that debut for Mia Yim, more of her in future weeks. Mahali defeats Michael Naka Naka Nakazawa in 523 with the twist of fate, a 37 here, just a simple victory for Matt Hardy. And I believe our main event of the pre-show was decent reaction from the crowd, subpar wrestling, Sammy Guevara, the Spanish god, defeats Matt Seidel in 11-17 with a 6-30. A 38 performance for Seidel, a 90 for Sammy Guevara. His great performance really stood out in a segment that delivered a 72. Tonight's show only starts with an 87, so maybe we did need Cody in there. But it's just a little promo from saying they've got another opportunity against the Lucha Brothers and this time, you know, they're just going to showcase how good they are. They're going to make sure they're in prime form going into Revolution. We know what Pac's doing, Moxley's matchup still to be determined in storyline, but I've got a rough idea where I'm going with that. But it's an 87 just to confirm that these two are still on the same page. Well, the contest of the night had subpar wrestling and little heat as catch point. Defeated Hybrid 2 in 908 when Drew Gulak submitted Jack Evans with the Gulak. A 65 here. A good win for the baby faces. Catch point. Gulak getting a good submission win over Evans and Angelico. I actually do like these two, but the rage in game kind of has me siding with the a little bit younger tag teams. After the matchup, Gulak and Riddle cut a promo. Do you like the more serious face? Riddle obviously has his, you know, bro, kind of stuff. But they basically call out Proud and Powerful and they're just saying a few more wins and they see themselves in prime contention to take those tag titles away from the Inner Circle's tag team. It was a 67. We had some eight-person tag team action, so two male and two female superstars on each team. It was a abysmal matchup that saw Maki Atoi, Yuka Sakazaki, and the Young Bucks defeat Charlie Evans, Killer Kelly and the Acclaimed and 7.50 when Maki Atoy pinned Anthony Bones. I'm clearly just trying to get her over and there's only limited she can do by beating the females so for some males that are over we'll give her some pinfalls in that regard as well. But doing everything I can to get these two over. But a 60. I'm delighted with that. A lot of positive said as you can see. The Bucks having a great time. Maki Atoy benefiting from the crowd support and the young female demographic, the Bucks looking excellent but I feel like they at least give me some good rating here alongside everyone else but Caster and Bowens can afford the defeat here and a 60 should hopefully be good for all parties. Then had Killer Cross get an easy victory over TK Cooper in 5.45 with a cross jacket, submission victory makes him look a million bucks and that was a 63. And after the matchup, he continues to have the submission in, and it takes the save of the AEW Light Champion, or AEW Live Champion, sorry, Scorpio Sky, 
to chase off Killer Cross. So a 53 here, this is obviously rated on a few permutations, including the overness of TK Cooper, which is why it's maybe not quite as high as I would have liked it to have been. But that's the angle. Scorpio saves TK from Killer Cross. We then had another women's matchup. It was Hikaru Shida defeating Zoe Lucas in 630 with the Majo no Irigechi. It's probably the ninth different pronunciation I've given her that. It's a geki. There we go. 32. Um, again, both aren't quite as over as I would like, so I think we need to get them to at least 50 over for the crowd to, to really care, at least for one of them. But we'll get there with Shida. As I say, we're hoping the tag team with Omega continues to work, although so far she doesn't seem to have gained any momentum. She still seems to have killed momentum and... The overness has not really changed, which is quite worrying. So maybe we need to get her getting the pinfall victories and pinning the guys. We'll keep an eye on it. Another Inner Circle versus Orange Cassidy match. This week it was Jake Hager that took on Freshly Squeezed. And in a good matchup, Cassidy picks up the win in 9.37 via a super kick. Actually, these two combined to make a very good matchup. A 78, 77 for Cassidy and a 76 for Hager. We're then greeted to a promo from Santana, Ortiz and Sammy Guevara and they basically call out first Sammy Guevara on Orange Cassidy just saying you beat uh, Ortiz last week, you bet Hager just wait till you face the Spanish God at Revolution you'll certainly not have the same fate there and Santana and Ortiz go are we really going to waste our time with losers such as Gulak and Riddle? If they can keep getting victories, then hell, maybe we'll give them a chance. But for now, you ain't even in our leagues. So an 87 promo there. So a lot of pressure on the main event. But one more match to go before the Two more matches to go, sorry, before then. With some six women action. So we're really giving the women all the chance they can with exposure on the main broadcasts. The Fashion Empire. Diona Perazzo, Chelsea Green and Britt Baker defeat Sadie Gibbs, Gazelle Shaw and Danny Luna in 804 when Chelsea pinned Danny. A 28 here. Oh, I'd say there's some good performances there. Danny Luna especially is a good performance. A 37 in the losing effort. Britt, Chelsea and Diona maybe could be doing a bit better. And the rating's only a 28 because none of them are particularly over. So they still need to be with Mercedes. That's why they're with Mercedes. But hopefully we can get them over. Gimmicks are not helping though. Mercedes then cuts a promo just basically promoting the fashion empire just saying how good they've done and under her wing they are going to be key players in this division but remember she is the queen of this division for now. Moving along we have a bit of a backstage altercation between Cody and QT Marshall. QT basically says he's not too impressed with what Cody's been like the last couple of weeks, the steps he took to become AW World Champion, and obviously just completely blanking out QT going forward. So Cody takes a bit of offence to this, and this matchup is going to happen right next. So QT just says, I'm tired of being berated with you in this, this part of the show. Let's just do it. Let's have a matchup, and I'll just prove. I can I can hang with you, I suppose, is what we're looking for here. And that's a 69 rated segment. Match itself is actually pretty good, 74. Decent matchup. Cody obviously defeats QT in 10 27 with the crossroads. A 74 segment here. And a 92 for Cody, a 40 for QT, and that's with Cody off his game as well. So I felt like it was just giving Cody some action, making sure he's still going to be in the best position going forward. But of course, clearly he's going to beat somebody with the overness of QT Marshall. Cody decides to set ringside for a main event. And there's a lot more pressure on the main event with us not getting that 100 angle. Obviously 87 just being the highest of the evening. So he's just going to sit at ringside and investigate and watch this matchup. Which will conclude the show. There's no post-match angle. Sorry to disappoint. And an 85. So they did go a bit more with this particular show um, and a wee bit more time but the lack of psychology limits that to an 85 but still delighted with that um, it's just giving me ideas for stuff to do in the future 
but we had about the head sensational wrestling and fantastic heat. And Pac and Moxley get revenge, the win over the Lucha Bros in 23 24 when Pac pinned Pentagon with the 450. 94 for Mox, 94 for Pac. Phoenix and Pentagon both nil in 100 rated performances, so obviously talented athletes alongside the fact they're really over in this game. And of course, the excellent chemistry will give that a boost as well. But yeah, just unable to make it stick with the lack of psychology. If you get psychology in that, I think we're close to 100, which is crazy. And gives me an idea for the future. The show itself, 83, uh, we increase our popularity in 35 regions. So there's a show where you can have a stronger main event, but because you don't have the promo, it doesn't quite deliver an amazing result. But still, I'm satisfied with it. And I wanted to test how that would work out. So, right, more on this MGF situation. The social media storm that Maxwell Jacob Friedman has been dealing with for a few days continues to get worse. The story has now become big enough that the several media outlets have now reported on it, bringing yet more attention and pressure to the situation. I can't sack him. I generally can't sack him. He's, on a, he's just signed a seven year deal on big money. Uh, at least Roddy's signing, that's always a good thing. So Hager says that she is too small and we get a 3.01. So I think we might take a wee bit of a hit in popularity because of this situation. So let's see what options we've got. So Roddy will sign uh, Babyface and it's a handshake deal so we can utilise him. How we all, I was always, as soon as he got released by WWE, there was interest, but obviously I didn't renew his contract. I didn't want to bring him in straight away, but there was short list and see what happens. It's becoming significantly worse. See, the problem is I want to do MGF versus Jericho. I need to appease though and give him a one month suspension. He's annoyed at the situation. Alright, okay. But what can you do? It's my biggest, it's one of my biggest stars. If not the biggest, in fact, if we just go to creative, brought a better recollection. He's my biggest star, there you go, great. He is the main man, and you can just see 25 year old, way over in the States, not so much elsewhere, but as I say, the States is predominantly where he is. Pretty much like Austin rock levels, and uh, as I say, if we go here, six years, ten months, and two weeks, uh, yeah. We are, uh, and look at that, as I say, if we didn't put him in that long term deal, he'd have cost us another 80k, which is mental. But he's been so over, and as I say, he's just continued to get over and over as times went on. So, uh, we'll just need to fight it, and we'll see how that story unfolds over the upcoming weeks. But that's it for this episode. Thank you very much for tuning in. Hope you enjoyed it. We're on the road, as I say, to Revolution. Next episode will be Dynamite in a few days' time. So cheers for watching. Good day, good night. Let me know if you've had any instances like the MGF social media storm. How you handled it? Did it affect you badly with your company or did you benefit from it? Let us know. Until next time, bye-bye.